reflect on why I think this is such an important study and such an important moment. Because actually, having worked in the field of HIV since the 1980s, we have come such a long way. We've come from a place where so many people died to a place now where we expect and we assume that everybody is going to live. But we have not got to a point where we're talking about quality of life. We have not yet properly got to a point where we understand what getting older with HIV is like. And there's a huge amount to learn. And I work at Homerton Hospital where about just over half our patients are women living with HIV. And the questions that I get asked about the menopause are frequent, they are unanswered, uh, and it has been an absolute delight to have a study, and we have been participants of the PRIME study, aiming to answer some of those questions, so that when we're asked as clinicians some of the really deep and meaningful questions that our patients bring to us, we will have the beginnings and some really robust evidence uh, to answer some of those uh, questions back. And I think one of the things that's really important is to think about how menopause affects women with HIV. And, and the, quest, the answer is, well, we don't know until we're going to hear the results of this study. Um, menopause is something that happens to all women during the course of their life, uh, during the course of the life course. And it's something that's biological. It's something that, that happens. But also, it's a social and it's a cultural issue. And that mirrors and layers upon the issues of living with HIV. And I would suggest that there are so many complexities for many of the women's lives with HIV already in it that menopause adds a new and complicated dimension. And so finding out how these intersections work uh, and the complexities of these changes in, in the life course for women living with HIV is, is really, really important. And I also think, and I think Shima may talk about this later, there is very little data about the intersection of menopause with other long-term medical conditions. So once again, HIV, I think, is maybe at the front of answering some really important questions that overlap. Because, of course, the other thing that happens is that in today's world, we don't yet have a cure for HIV. And so women living with HIV are almost all going to be taking medication of some sort for the moment, for the foreseeable future. And that maybe complicates how other drugs work. It maybe complicates what happens to their own body changes as the menopause cuts in. Um, so we have to ask questions about bone toxicity, renal toxicity, cardiovascular toxicity, all of which are things that perhaps are not happening in the same way to either younger women or to other people living with HIV in quite the same way. So we really need this data and we really need this study. Um, so Shima has um, engaged, I think, a really important way of working with this study, and we're going to hear more about that. Um, because I was at a meeting this morning, which and it really struck me. There's a lot of talk about progress and medical systems. And uh, the thing that stuck with me that I heard this morning is somebody said, progress moves at the speed of trust. And the thing about making progress in this area where we so badly need progress is that we are going to do it, I, I believe, on a piece of work that has engendered trust and has only perhaps had its success because it's engendered trust between academics, doctors, communities, patients. And I think that's a really important issue. Um, and I think that Shima has shown us a method of working and a method of researching that's really important and I hope will uh, shine a light on things going forward. Um, and it's a very great pleasure, actually, and, and a huge privilege to have worked with Shima over, I'm trying to think how many years, but it's more than I'd like to remember. Uh, but, um, but Shima has, um, I've known Shima both as <coughs> a doctor in training, as a consultant physician, and as an academic, uh, and she fulfills all those roles absolutely stupendously, and being able to bring them all together in a topic that has got such relevance and such community importance, I think is a real triumph, and particularly using her methodology. So um, I'm going to keep everybody to time, because I think we've got to be not only 
out of the room by five o'clock, but there is a real interest in, uh, I think, an after-event drink. So uh, we will have a fascinating um, afternoon. Uh, there is going to be a reception afterwards, um, and I hope very much that you will not only be here to listen, but also to engage. There will be opportunities for questions. We've got a very formidable panel to discuss the findings at the end of the afternoon. So um, I think the first thing to do is to hand over to Rebecca, who's going to give us uh, the first reflections. Uh, Rebecca Mbebwe, M I'm sorry I've got this uh, pronounced you wrong to start off with, um, who's a freelance consultant, has been really embedded in the steering group and the work of this, uh, this study. So Rebecca, would you like to kick us off uh, with the experience of menopause and HIV? Thank you, Jane. Good afternoon, everyone. Right, so first, I'd like to thank the organisers for inviting me to speak. I'm very honoured. Um, you won't find anyone as thrilled and as enthusiastic as I, wanting to talk about HIV and menopause in the same breath. <laughs> I'll tell you why. When I was diagnosed in 1996, I was 28 years old with a seven-year-old son. Things in the HIV sector, as we all know, weren't very good at the time. People were still dying. And like many, I too thought I wouldn't have very long to live, let alone get to an age where I would have to deal with the menopause. I mean, don't get me wrong, you can see why I'm thrilled. At that young age, and not being able to look too far ahead, all I did was manage my life on a day-to-day -day basis. Didn't think beyond that. Things did improve. And 22 years later, me and my funky silver hair box is still here. So in the wake of advances of treatment, we were given a new lease of life, which means we could, you know, age gracefully, disgracefully. But with that and lots of research on how HIV affects our health, the PRIME study being a very good example of that, we've learned and are still learning what impact, has, what impact HIV has on our health. I'll leave the stats to the experts. I don't particularly like numbers, so I'll stay away from that. And then I'll focus on my experiences of actually living with HIV and the menopause which I'm still going through, by the way. I think for me, one of the biggest things or one of the biggest challenges was being unprepared for this stage of my life. You don't know what to expect, and sometimes it can be quite daunting and confusing. And I guess that comes in two ways, psychologically and physically. That's not to say that women not living with HIV don't have the same experiences, but I guess with women who are living with HIV, it's compounded by all the other factors that we have to deal with. Um, if you think, for example, that uh, women living with HIV are more prone to mental health issues, so that's you know an added complication. Um, there are the challenges, for example, for those of us that English isn't a first language, there are language barriers, and this can affect how you articulate how you feel, how you describe your symptoms, how you communicate with your clinicians and other healthcare workers. Um, and then there's culture, which doesn't permit you to discuss these things. Menopause is not one of those conversations that you tend to have. But I guess I think I was more fortunate than most, because by the time I started my journey with faithful old menopause, I had the opportunity to attend one of the focus groups that was being done within the PRIME study. And I tell you, this couldn't have come at a more opportune time. Because of that focus group, I was able to clarify a lot of the myths about menopause, but also listen to the experiences of other women, which was really, really insightful. I learned about the symptoms, what causes them, and how to manage them. And that was a great help. And then also where I could get support if I needed it. I remember thinking, this is the kind of thing that we need. Information and more conversations about menopause 
rather than the beast that we all make it out to be. In terms of the work it has on, in, uh, in terms of the impact it has on work and in everyday life, I can say I didn't feel as much of the impact back then, because I was sort of teetering just 47 or thereabout. Um, but yes, now I feel it every day. The fatigue, the grumpiness, I'm sure a lot of you can relate. The lack of sexual interest, please just don't touch me. The hot flushes, the list is endless. The difference between then and now is that I'm more informed to differentiate even to other women. We I'm not losing my There are measures so where to access it. So before I go off and deal with another hot flush, <laughs> I want to leave you with three things. So information is key for both women living with HIV but also for all the other er healthcare areas that we need to access. Knowing that as a woman living with HIV, I'm more likely to experience um, menopause symptoms slightly earlier is important so that the right questions are asked and that there is access to the right support. And then communication, for me, I think is number two. We speak to each other. Let's talk about these things openly and honestly talk about how we feel, talk about how we don't want to feel, and a whole lot of other things. I mean, just talk. Otherwise, you will not be able to access the right support, and I'll tell you what, it will make you go crazy. And then my last point, I think, is more specific to women with um, the menopause, going through the menopause. HRT is your friend. <laughs> don't believe all the hype. And I know it'll vary depending on each individual, but I think it's worth giving it a try. Okay? Rebecca, thank you very much for setting the scene so nicely for us and giving us a snapshot of, uh, of the reality of, of life with the menopause. Um, so I'm going to hand over now to Shima, who's going to give us some background to the study and the design of the study, um, which is really innovative and interesting. So Shima, the floor is yours. Over to you. So thanks, everybody. It's a real delight to be here and to look out on a room that's filled with colleagues and friends and participants, and um, it's just a really nice afternoon. Um, as Jane says, what I'm going, there is quite a lot of me this afternoon, so bear with me. Um, what I'm going to do for the next 20 or so minutes is just present the background to the study, so what led us to develop this work, um, and then talk you through what the methods were. Um, later on, we'll be going through uh, the key results. So Jane's already alluded to this, um, but this is a graph that's showing you the number of women accessing HIV care by age group over a 10-year period. So we know in general that we have an uh, ageing cohort of people living with HIV, but I think it's important to break this down by gender. So these are women accessing HIV care, and what you can see, if you look at the red bars. This is women aged between 45 to 56, which is when you would expect women to go through the menopause. And just so we're all on the same page, what I mean by menopause is the time when our ovaries stop working due to age. And it usually happens around the age of 52. That's when our periods stop, but it's a slow transition during that process. So I'm not talking about menopause that's induced by having surgery or by other treatments. This is natural menopause. So, going back to this graph, what you can see is that there's been a substantial increase in the numbers of women living with HIV, attending for HIV care um, in this age group, in this potentially menopausal age group. To a point in 2016, where about 10,000 women a year attending for HIV care were in this age group. That's approximately one in three women. And that's only going to increase. 
because women are going to continue to survive with antiretroviral therapy, doing very well, and reaching their 50s and 60s and beyond. And Public Health England estimate that we will see approximately another 10 to 20,000 women entering into this age group in the next five to 10 years. So I think the point of this graph for me is to show you that the future for HIV care of women is going to have to focus on the needs of women reaching their midlife and beyond. And that's something that I think we have neglected um, up until recently. So what do we know about menopausal symptoms? So this is just a slide showing you um, what we know about menopause in general, not specifically about HIV. So the vast majority of women who go through the menopause will experience some degree of symptoms, primarily what we call vasomotor symptoms, which are hot flushes. Um, now, not all of these women will uh, experience troubling symptoms. For some women, these symptoms will be manageable. For about one in four women who experience hot flushes, they will be so severe that they disrupt their day-to-day -day life. The median duration of symptoms is longer than we often think. It's about seven years. And the genital symptoms of menopause, which is vaginal dryness, pain during sex, uh, recurrent urinary tract infection, things that are actually really reduce your quality of life. Those symptoms that affect upwards of 65% of women postmenopausally, those symptoms can be lifelong. So it is unsurprising that in the wider literature that the menopause is associated with both negative impacts on work, on relationships, and reduced quality of life and perceived health. So it's an important transition, important life event in a woman's life. So what kind of symptoms do women feel? So we've already talked about the cardinal sign, which is hot flushes, which most people will be aware of. But it's important to remember that menopause can affect you in a whole variety of ways throughout your body. So I've briefly touched upon the genital symptoms. So this is the vaginal dryness, the sexual pain. Women can often describe aches and pains when they're going through the menopause, but also as you go through the menopause, so up until date the widespread availability of antiretroviral therapy, so they're often focused on women who were diagnosed with very advanced HIV, so may not apply to um, practice here in the UK. The other issue with the US studies is that the women living with HIV in the US are very different to the women we see here in the UK. There's a high rate of recreational drug use, so in a lot of the American cohorts you're seeing about 25% use of crack cocaine, which is associated with earlier menopause and increased symptoms. So again, I think it's hard to extrapolate from those studies. And of course, access to healthcare is very, very different. So it's hard for us to look at the US studies and say, we'll take their findings and apply it here. However, if you do look at those studies, there's certainly a suggestion that women living with HIV um, experience menopause slightly earlier than those without HIV. And there's definite increased evidence that women with HIV increase more sim um, experience more symptoms. What is clear from the few bits of work that have been done in this area are that menopausal symptoms go under-recognized, both by women living with HIV themselves and also their clinicians. It is, I think, as Rebecca has said so eloquently, it's easy to see why, if you're getting these kind of vague symptoms, why you could attribute that to HIV and not to menopause. And finally, in the studies that have been conducted, which are very few, use of HRT, hormone replacement therapy, which is hormones that women can take during the menopause for symptoms, is about 10%, which I understand is similar to the use of HRT in the general population. So it's low overall. So I think it's reasonable at this point to say, well, why do we expect menopause to be any different for women living with HIV? What's the point of doing this study? Is it not going to be the same as for a woman without HIV? So these are just my thoughts sketched out. So the first thing is, um, we know that in studies um, that have been conducted in men living with HIV, that they have low testosterone. And so there clearly is an impact of HIV on um, production of sex hormones. And it is reasonable to hypothesize that women living with HIV may experience a similar phenomenon, that HIV may affect the ovaries. And there have been some American studies that have reported findings that support that. I think the other thing to bear in mind is the impact of chronic illness. And I think 
this can't be overstated. The impact of already living with a long-term condition and then throwing in a whole range of new symptoms, especially when you're living with a long-term condition that requires daily adherence to medication and long-term engagement in care. For those women who perhaps were diagnosed late, if we think about opportunistic infections, so HIV-related infections that may affect the brain and that may actually precipitate earlier menopause, we think about antiretroviral therapy. We're really at the start of trying to understand how antiretroviral therapy may affect um, metabolism of estrogen. I don't think that's really been looked at in anywhere near enough detail. We know that HIV is a chronic inflammatory condition. Even in the context of well-controlled HIV, there is likely to be some ongoing inflammation. We still don't know whether that inflammation affects the hormone axis and could precipitate either earlier menopause or more symptoms. And then, of course, the coexisting factors. So, as um, Rebecca said, the sort of intersection of lots of other things that women living with HIV may be experiencing. So, Poverty, social, other social stresses such as issues to do with migration, maybe drug use, smoking, um, co-infections with hepatitis B or hepatitis C, all of these things that are going to pattern your symptoms. So you can see, looking at this, that there is plenty enough reason to imagine why HIV may, cause, um, may lead to women experiencing the menopause slightly differently to women without HIV, or where there might be particular areas that we need to attend to. So just to summarise what previous studies have shown, and as you can see, this is really the extent of the literature over you know, 30 years, 11 studies. Um, so previous studies have shown that women living with HIV experience increased hot flushes, increased psychological symptoms, so this is compared to women without HIV. There's one study that's looked at cognition, so looked at memory and processing, and hasn't shown any difference. One, a couple of studies that have looked at sexual function, and studies that have clearly shown that there's an increased risk of osteoporosis, fractures, and increased cardiovascular risk. So I'd say that these final two points are clearly established. But what about other things that I think most of us in this room would say are critically important. So as Jane says, what about someone's quality of life? What about the impact of the menopause on a woman's ability to engage in care? What about the impact of menopause on a woman's ability to adhere to treatment? And I think these are really important questions which have never been answered before. So that's a bit of background to the study. Um, you can see that from the work that's been done before that there are clear gaps in evidence and that led us to develop the prime study so we actually put in for funding in 2013 so nearly five years ago so this has been a long time coming to get to this point the overall aim of the study is to look at what is the impact of the menopause transition on the health and the well-being of women living with hiv we have a set of five questions uh, we have a whole load of other questions that we want to ask, but these were the key questions we started out with. We wanted to describe the prevalence of both menopause and symptoms by age in a group of women living with HIV. We want to try and identify predictors of age at menopause and predictors of menopausal symptoms in a group of women living with HIV. We wanted to explore associations between both menopausal status and symptoms, and a variety of what we think are important and neglected outcomes, such as mental health, sexual function, quality of life, adherence to treatment, and retention in HIV care. We also wanted to describe the current management of menopause and women living with HIV here in the UK, which hadn't been done before on a large scale. And what was really key for us was to also explore the lived experience of menopause and women living with HIV. So to talk to women is try and document what it's actually like day to day to be managing the two things together. So to do this, we undertook a mixed methods research um, approach. And mixed methods is a combination of using quantitative and qualitative methods. And the ease, this is how I explain this to my students. So um, I'm not sure if you're familiar with the folk tale of the blind men and the elephant. So in India, elephant arrives in a village, and there's six blind men. 
and they're each feeling a different part of the elephant. And you can imagine if there's one blind man describing the trunk, that his idea of what the elephant might be like or what might, the elephant might look like is very different to the man who's feeling the tail. However, if you put all the six men together and get them to talk to each other, what you get is a more complete picture, sort of the whole elephant. And that's kind of how I see mixed methods research. I see it as having multiple different lenses, multiple perspectives on the same question to try and get a more complete account. Um, if you're just looking at numbers or you're just looking at words, you sometimes miss part of the story. So this is uh, the overall design of the prime study. This might not project so well, and I know this is in your report as well. Um, it was a three-phase study that was conducted between 2015 and 2018. It actually closed about three weeks ago, so we're very close to the wire here. Um, in phase one, we conducted three focus group discussions with women living with HIV aged um, 45 and over. This was conducted in pos uh, Positively UK and really facilitated by our tremendous team of peer researchers who you're going to hear from after me. Um, at the same time, we also conducted a survey of menopause management in HIV amongst GPs, and I'll be presenting that to you later on. We then moved to phase two, which was the main part of the study, which was a questionnaire study um, conducted across 21 HIV clinics in England. I know some of our PIs are here sat in the room, and I'm very grateful to you and your teams for all your work in recruiting this large number of patients. Um, Women were invited to complete a paper-based questionnaire in the clinic, which was sent to us. Um, it was really important for us to have representation from clinics outside of London. HIV research is often accused of being London-centric, and I think rightly so. So we did have six sites outside of London. We approached about 2,000 women, and about 700 of those women weren't eligible. And that was mainly because they'd either had a hysterectomy or that their menopause was five, more than five years ago. We wanted to capture women who'd experienced menopause women. This makes PRIME one of the largest studies of HIV and ageing in the world. Um, and I think potentially a very important resource going forward. And finally, in phase three, for the past year and a half, I've been conducting in-depth interviews with women living with HIV who participated in the questionnaire part of this study, really to explore their experiences, but also to find out if there was anything that we'd missed in the questionnaires. In terms of the organisation of the study, this is a real team effort. Although you're going to hear a lot from me today, <laughs> there's a whole team who's made this happen. So I'm very grateful to the core study team based at UCL, who've really been supporting me and mentoring me from the very beginnings of putting a funding application. So that's Fiona Burns, Richard Gilson, Alexandra Rowland, who's my research coordinator and really has been my right-hand woman for the past two years, Caroline Sabin, um, our fantastic expert advisory group, I can't thank them individually, they're at the back of the report, amazing group of expertise, um, and our three community representatives who you're going to hear from straight after this. And we were funded by the NIH, NIHR up until three weeks ago. It's a very sore point. <laughs> but I also, before I hand over to um, our community reps, want to take some time to acknowledge everybody else who really helped us get to this point. I should have switched my phone off, shouldn't I? <laughs> so um, two really fantastic psychology research assistants who've worked with us, Tahina and Salia, who are both here today. The teams at the 21 clinical sites, we could not have recruited this number of women without you. You've just put tremendous work and effort into this. Positively UK, who we've partnered with throughout the study, who have been really important partners and supporters of this work. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Fantastic. Thank you for that. Before we move on, are there any questions of fact or clarification? I don't want to get into the big discussion yet, but are there points or things that Shima you wanted to explain in a bit more detail? Or is it all quite clear what she did and how she got to this point? Perfectly clear, so far. That's okay. good. <laughs> well, we'll have plenty of time to, to have a bigger discussion with it, but just making sure that everybody's clear with how we got to this bit. So, uh, I think we're now going to have three speakers together um, here. So, it's a great um, privilege to introduce Janine McGregor Reed, who is here, um, woman of the HIV, but 
27 years, uh, works for Positive UK, and you're one of our fabulous peer navigators at Homerton Hospital. Uh, Fiona Pettit, um, who has been, uh, you've been diagnosed for a long time, um, and you're volunteering with the International Community of Women with HIV. It's quite some time ago. I'm a volunteer with Positively UK. And you're volunteering with Positively UK. And Jane Shepherd, um, you've been living with HIV for a long time. And have been. Um, <laughs> 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 and and a long, long time. Long time. <laughs> 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 And um, you've, been, you've been helping and you've been actually developing research and been really crucial to, I think, uh, the description of the, the elephant and putting all the bits together. So over to the three of you to take us through the next bit of the research process. Thanks. Thank uh, because there's three of us and three community reps, we thought we would do this um, a bit, probably not in conversation because it'll just be rambling. Um, but I'm going to ask a few questions um, about uh, why we got involved with the PRIME study um, and what we gave to it, what were our different roles and our, our perspectives and also um, what we gained from it. So just to start off with me, I mean, when I saw the call out for UK CAB community representatives, which we applied for, I was just like, I couldn't believe it. I couldn't believe how fantastic it was to see a study that was about me and my experiences and about something that's never spoken about. I mean, you know, whether you're living with HIV or not, the menopause, when you, when you arrive at it, you realise nobody talks about it. So it was fantastic. So I was going to ask Janine first. Okay. Um, what, what made you want to get involved in Prime? So it spoke to me personally and professionally. Um, I... I'm a woman living with HIV and I'm of menopausal age. I was at the start of the study um, kind of perimenopausal and now I'm definitely menopausal. <laughs> um, and professionally, I work for Positively UK and I'm also based at the Homerton and I see the majority of my clients that I see are women and they kind of range in age mostly from their 20s right through to 60s. So this work, this study is absolutely pertinent to supporting those women fully. And I think in, in my case, I was also, I think I had gone through the menopause before I applied to become a community rep, but it looked like a, a fantastic project to get involved in. And I suppose going back to the days of ICW, I, I remembered hearing before treatment about younger women talking about how they were having sort of menopausal symptoms and couldn't quite work out what was going, what was going on. And then after that, um, nothing really seemed to happen about the menopause. There wasn't any sort of research that I was aware of. And then so coming more recently to find out this project was taking place and the fact that it um, included a, a strong, cheaper element, the greater involvement of people living with HIV, then I thought this is a, a fantastic project to get involved in and to look at the issues and bring them out onto the table um, and from, from which point we can start to find solutions to the issues that come up. Thanks. And we all, I, we all brought different perspectives to the prime study. We all come from different backgrounds, we have different experiences and we have different roles. I mean, I'm a graphic designer, first and foremost, um, but it's ended up really useful because I've been able to help with uh, making the information clear and with the dissemination of the, the, um, the report. But you came, you, Janine, came from... Yeah, as a peer navigator, um, which is my role with Positively UK, um, but mainly based at the Homerton, um, I was able to invite women that I had built relationships with over time to the focus groups, which was the first phase of the study. Uh, they, there were three focus groups. They were all very well attended. And the women shared in a way that, you know, to this day I can remember some of those conversations. They were so impacting. I, and I think it was the fact that we were focusing on women's reproductive lives. Um, you know, really, people were talking from the onset of menstruation right through to describing their symptoms in the menopause. Um, and they were talking about such intimate parts of their lives. We had women talking about 
how they had difficulty conceiving fertility issues. Um, these are things that are so taboo for some of these women um, to actually speak in an open space, but we've made it a safe space and they were able to share and really kind of be seen by their peers. Um, you know, you had women who talked about almost shutting down their sex lives. They were so traumatised by the stigma of being an HIV positive woman. Uh, we had women talking about the pains that they experienced through uh, being HIV and maybe the treatment of, of the treatment they were taking, they felt had given them side effects. Uh, there was so much powerful information that was shared in a way that I felt, you know, I've listened to a lot of conversations, I've run women's groups, but I hadn't heard it in that way. And I really thought, wow, these people are so experienced and we're so resilient. Mm -hmm. And it really was um, an absolute privilege to be part of those focus groups. And what was your experience, Fiona? I'm very similar. I, mean, I think the, the focus groups fitted in perfectly with um, uh, some, uh, uh, something called Age to Perfection that Positively UK, which Positively UK, if you um, don't know Positively UK, grew out of Positively Women that started providing support to women to, to back in the sort of late 80s or early 90s. And I know really saved me from some very dark moments when I was able to go to their groups. Um, but we, we, Janine and I were on a steering committee that uh, organised um, a monthly group for uh, older people for living with HIV called Age to Perfection and it really sort of fitted perfectly into that and we had a, a really great turnout by the sessions that we had, the prime focus groups that we held during Age to Perfection. I mean, the, the number of women who, who came to those meetings, that we were sort of overflowing. And it, as Janine says, the, the, the issues that they were bringing out was a very, really important and very sort of moving to hear them talking, sometimes for the first time. I mean, one thing that came out in the focus groups was the, the possible need to have something like a, a mentor auntie, I think. Yes. We, yeah. and, and so that those conversations could be, sort of, could take place amongst peers. So. Yeah, the value of um, peer researchers. Mm. It can't yes. be understated at all. Yes. I mean, I wasn't able to be a peer researcher because I was out of London, so I couldn't actually take part in the focus groups, but I mean, my, my role, a lot of my role was about bringing the study to the attention through UK CAB to the community in large and to what is usually a, you know, a big group of white gay men who know nothing about menopause at all. <laughs> um, and also then in the end to be able to be involved in designing and being able to do the logo and the report. And you know, all that involvement really gave me a sense of ownership and a feeling like I'm part of this project and also being able to kind of build relationships with my peers as well as clinicians. Um, and I wanted to ask you, Janine, what you felt was the impact of being part of this for you? I mean, I think a lot of the things that we saw in those focus groups, I see in my work in Homerton um, when I'm supporting women. And I think... I think one of the findings from the report was that women have this difficulty of distinguishing where their symptoms are coming from. Is it the HIV that's generating the pains, the hot flushes, the, or is it the menopause? Um, and when I speak to women about their lives, you, you know, you quite quickly realise that their personal needs and health and well-being comes after you know, looking after kids, maybe looking after elderly parents, being responsible for bringing in the income, um, maybe holding down a job. There's so much stresses on women's lives. And so what I try and do is make a space where we can bring it back to, well, how are you feeling and, you know, if you are having these symptoms, what kind of plan of action can we take? So a big part of what I do is referral work. So I find that, you know, if 
women are feeling that they have symptoms that they're not feeling are being properly addressed, it may be that they need to go back to their GP and talk again about if they need to take HRT. Uh, possibly they could be looking at their diet. So there's organisations like Food Chain which help people look at their nutrition and maybe, you know, think about what's the right balance of um, food that will support your health better um, in terms of the menopause. And also exercise. I think, you know, I do a lot of exercise referral programs. Um, YMCA is the one that we probably use most. Do you do these things yourself? I do it as a peer <laughs> navigator. <laughs> <laughs> I, I you have need a, a peer navigator. <laughs> I, I have um, been to the YMCA and I have been to Food Chain and we've sometimes done this through positive UK, oh, taking a group of women yeah. down to these places. Yeah. And they can see the link between, you know, if you engage with these services, if you're not isolated and you go to support groups, then you're starting to get this knowledge and you're starting to do things that help lift your mm. sense of well-being mm. and maybe you don't go through the menopause with such a sense of, you know, kind of the downsides of feeling mm. like, you know, you're in pain and you're alone and there's no one to talk to um, in a support group that you can turn to your neighbour yeah. and say yeah. that you're feeling this way. And mm -hmm. Um, yeah, I just feel like I feel like they, we really need to create these spaces where women can look at what they're experiencing and feeling and think about what actions they can take to help yeah. improve the situation. Yeah. And Fiona, do you feel, because you, you know, you've been a, an activist for so long, <laughs> do you feel that this project, there was true meaningful involvement of women in this project? How... Does it resonate yeah. for you? I think so, because we were involved at all stages. I mean, I wasn't involved right at the very, very beginning, and neither one, none, none of us were right at the very beginning. But we, um, but for the part that I was involved in, yes, it seemed that we were. I mean, we were going to the um, executive committee, committee meetings and part participating in those meetings participating in setting up the focus group meetings, um, sort of looking at uh, what had come out of the focus group meetings and sort of, sort of learning a bit about coding and, and that, that side of research, which is fun. Um, so, but yeah, so I think it had a sort of really sort of good sort of GPA yeah. or GPA sort of MEPA. MEPA, WEPA, <laughs> <laughs> sort of thread running Weeper. through it, yeah. so, which is yeah. so important. And, and I guess that's why, you know, we, we had so many women at those focus groups. I mean, you, you often hear that there's an issue with, with sort of women becoming involved in, in sort of research like that. But I don't think we, we found that with, yeah, no, with Prime. Sure. Yeah. So. yeah. So it was, yeah, and I think personally it was great to to help me to sort of untangle some of the, the bits that had been sort of plaguing me over, over a few years, things became a little clearer to me. And I just hope that in the future, that something, that, that, yeah, that it continues and that women yeah. can to continue to be involved, continue to, be, to educate themselves about the menopause. So. Yeah. And influence others. Yeah. So, yeah, I think that's... Um, We'll end with saying it, we felt collectively it was a really good example of, of an innovative kind of good practice of involving women living with HIV at all stages of the research yeah. and um, it was a quite an empowering experience and I would just like to as a final note to say because um, I was part of Prime and I spoke to my clinician it kind of oh no it's because she went to a Beaver conference <coughs> and saw a presentation by Shima they started a, a menopause clinic in the, the GU clinic and, and I got referred and I got onto HRT. Yay. And I feel fantastic. Yay. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks. Thanks. Thank you all very much. Hang on, hang on, I just want to say oh, questions about this because it's such an important part of the study that actually you know what Fiona was saying that that sense of having been part of it mm. all the way along um, and just listening to Janine the sense of, of what it's enabling you to do as well as mm. the research to do sort of two-way aspect and I don't know if there are many queries so Lorraine I, I just have one because you both 
though you all three speak about um, having been diagnosed some time ago, and I wonder if within the groups there were women who were newly diagnosed, because we, we always think, oh, you know, women over a certain age must have gotten things when they were 19. You know, women over 50 do have sex, and they might mm, have yes. yeah, yeah, yeah. And yeah. was their experience different? Because they would be dealing afresh and new with a lot of things, sort of simultaneously. I just wonder if, if everyone had a similar um, history to you, or if there was some different kind of groups? Oh, she didn't I, know. I yeah. think the majority of mm. the women that I meet have been diagnosed long, longer term. So, the, when I think know. of the people that I invited that come to mind, they were longer term diagnosed. Obviously, we do see women in the clinic who, have, who are older and have been recently diagnosed. I, I can't remember how many of them were in the focus groups, though. Or in the question Yeah, the vast majority were long term diagnosed, and I think that's also not only a reflection of the age group, but a reflection of the fact that these were women engaged with Positively yeah. UK mm. anyway. Yeah. Mm. But in the questionnaire part of the study, we do have, I can't remember off the top of my head, we have a minority of women who were diagnosed within the past five years. Mm. And we're able, we will be able to tease out differences by that. Mm. And we've also got some data, not about the menopause, but the whole study compared people over the age of, eight, of 50, both relatively recently diagnosed mm. and living with HIV for a long time and comparing those experiences. But actually, no experience of menopause in there because they were mostly men in that study. So <laughs> this is why this is so important. But uh, are there any other questions? Yes. Um, so you've all spoken about living with HIV for a long time. Had you ever been approached for research in the group in the past? And if so, how has that experience been for you? On the, the menopause or just on, on any... Anything in general? Yeah, I mean, I've tried to participate in, in sort of research projects when they come up. And I think sometimes you... To me, a, a, a good research project is... I mean, great if it, it involves you in, in its design and development, but if, if there's a participant, I would expect to get something back from the research, either sort of information about how the research is progressing, how it's going to be improving my life as a result of participating in the project, in, in the research. And I think in the past I've, I've been involved with in some research projects that haven't done that. They sort of, sort of come in and take the information from you and off they go and that's the last you hear, hear of them. So I think... Um, no, but, I mean, that's kind of the answer I was expecting. <laughs> I think this is a very, very, very different approach. I think mm. it's a really significant move. And as a final wrap up, Reverend, to what extent do you feel, because all three of you are actively engaged in supporting women uh, in your other roles, that your enthusiasm helped? Because you know, the recruitment that she would described for a study like this was fabulous. Um, and to what extent do you think that having the relationships you did actually helped that? Mm. Was that a, a reason, do you think, that it, does that help? I mean, absolutely. I, I, for, for me, my work at Positive UK and in the hospital totally made it. And, and just being diagnosed with 27 years, I know a lot of women. <laughs> and I was able yeah. to just call on them. And, and, and you know, it, we all knew that this was something we hadn't actually spoken about before. So it was really, you know, people... I think even when we sat down and started talking, people were so aware that... We haven't had this. We haven't talked about our sexual lives before. Like so, it really feels like prime studies shone a light that that hadn't been quite, you know, recognised. And I don't really know why that is. I, I actually think, when I think about my even my relationship with my consultant, they would ask me about my children. They never asked me about myself and my personal <laughs> life. You know, because. You know, as a sexual person, I probably didn't exist. <laughs> Clearly. <laughs> On which happy note. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you all three very, very much for those insightful bits. And I think we've now got.
clear sense of how the study was conceived, why it was conceived, how it was done, who was involved in the doing. And so now the crucial moment, um, Shima and colleague Nazreen, who's a master student, are going to actually go through the results with us, um, which is a um, really fascinating bit of the afternoon. So is Nazreen coming up with you? No, Naz is fine. I'll, I'll give Naz a shout when we're ready. We'll do it in two halves. So yes. back to Shima for the results. So over to you. OK, so I think we've got about 40 to 45 minutes to talk you through three years of results. So um, <laughs> wish me luck. Um, as I'm presenting, I'm going to really just be trying to tell you about the key findings. I'm not going to go into details about the statistics. I'm not going to go into details about the methods. If you're really geeky like me and you want to find out about it, you can come and talk to me about it afterwards. But I think it's important that you just get the key findings. Also, you'll notice throughout the presentation that the numbers of women on each slide are going to change. And that's just because for each analysis, we're using slightly different groups of women from the data. The final thing to keep in mind is that this is a study that was just conducted in women living with HIV. We do not have an HIV negative comparison group. So I cannot tell you that the findings here are different to women living with HIV. I can refer to previous um, data in existing literature, but we just, we just aren't able to draw any conclusions. And again, if you're interested to know why we haven't got an HIV negative comparison group, you can um, come and chat to me about it later. So let's start. I'm going to start with a description, so a broad overview of the women who participated in the PRIME study. So this is the 869 amazing women across England. So the average age of women participating in the PRIME study is 49, um, with an interquartile range between 47 to 53, which is what you would expect um, when you're looking for women who've been through the menopause within the past five years. Um, the eligibility criteria was women aged between 45 and 60. So if you look at the characteristics of these women, they are broadly representative of women attending for HIV care in the UK. <coughs> So 72% of women in the prime study were black African, of black African ethnicity, which is entirely consistent with the UK epidemic of HIV amongst women. Now, if we look at other demographic factors, the vast majority of women had completed either A-levels or university. Again, this is very typical of women living with HIV in the UK. This is predominantly a migrant population who are highly educated and professional. When we look at employment status, a third of women weren't employed or weren't currently employed, and about 10% reported that they did not have enough money to cover their basic needs. So that's one in 10 women who were um, significantly affected by poverty. And I think this is also an important slide. Um, so we did ask about recreational drug use in the past three months all types of recreational drugs. And you can see that it's a really small minority of women who report recreational drug use. And the reason I'm bringing this out is going back to what I was saying before about looking at data from the US, where we often try and get our conclusions about HIV and menopause, where they're reporting 25% recreational drug use. You can see why this study was important. We have a very different group of women attending for HIV care here in the UK. And what about HIV-related um, um, factors? So this is a group of women who are primarily, predominantly on antiretroviral therapy. So 98% of women are on antiretroviral therapy in the PRIME study. 70% um, of them have a CD4 count of over 500. And nearly 90% of them are undetectable. So this is essentially a group of women who are stable on treatment. So let's think about their menopausal status. So the way, we, um, the way we're able to categorise menopausal status is not through doing blood tests. We just ask women when their last period was. And that has been validated in previous studies. So the way we define it is women were defined as premenopausal if they had regular periods. They were perimenopausal if they'd had irregular periods over the past two years. We have a set number of validated questions to establish that. And postmenopausal if they hadn't had a period for 12 months or more. 
And it's really important to remember also in prime, we excluded women who were on hormonal con contraception. We excluded women who had been pregnant. We excluded women who were breastfeeding. There are women who are over 45 who get pregnant and breastfeed. <laughs> and we excluded women who'd had either their ovaries removed or they uh, had had it. So as I'm presenting, I'm going to be drawing upon not only the survey data, so the data from the 869 women who completed the questionnaire, I'm also going to be bringing in some of the qualitative data from our interviews and focus groups to try and give you that whole elephant picture I was telling you about before. So we looked at the prevalence of menopausal symptoms, so reported symptoms amongst this group of women. Now we divide these symptoms, again we capture this through a validated set of questions um, called the menopause rating scale. It's 11 questions asking about very different types of whole body symptoms. And it's divided into three domains. The somatic domain, which is hot flushes, palpitations, joint and muscle discomfort, and sleep disturbance. Urogenital, vaginal dryness, urinary tract, uh, urinary tract symptoms, and sexual problems. And then finally, psychological symptoms. So depression, anxiety, irritability, and exhaustion. I guess the first take home message is, Regardless of menopausal status, the vast majority of women in prime reported some degree of symptoms in one of these domains. 89% of women in prime, so this is the whole cohort, described having somatic symptoms. 68% of women described urogenital symptoms. And 78% described psychological symptoms. The key or the most commonly reported symptoms were hot flushes, sleep disturbance, mood-related symptoms, and um, loss of libido. And I think that's really important because that is so, the loss of libido and um, sexual function, which Naz is going to be talk, uh, talking about more, is something that's often um, neglected in women of this age group, regardless of HIV status. The other thing, so thinking about these symptoms and this high level of symptoms, is what does that mean for women when they're already living with a long-term condition? And I think this quote um, encapsulates a lot of what we heard in the focus group, which is, OK, you're getting these symptoms, but if you're already living with HIV, a lot of the symptoms could be very similar to symptoms you've experienced um, as a result of HIV, or you're taking medication and you're worried about, are these symptoms menopause? Are these HIV-related symptoms? Are these side effects from my medication? And we quite regularly heard, both in the focus groups and, both, and in the interviews that I conducted, women talking about real uncertainty about their medication and wanting to stop taking treatment to see if these menopausal, what sounded like menopausal symptoms, whether these symptoms would go away. And you can see that um, summarised here by this participant who says, it leaves you feeling what is going on here. Is it HIV? Is it the menopause? And I think this is a new finding, this uncertainty about where these symptoms are coming from. And again, this other quote from a participant in a focus group, which I think is really important, and this really speaks of what it's like to be going through the menopause when you're already managing a long-term condition. So she says, if I wasn't coping with HIV and I was dealing with the menopause alone, it would be easier, but I've got to cope with two, the, both of them at the same time. And if you haven't slept for the whole night and you need to take medication, it just gets so annoying. I really like her understatement. <laughs> so moving forward, we not only wanted to look at menopausal symptoms, but we wanted to look at the impact of menopausal symptoms on women. And I think one of the key things is looking at the impact of symptoms on women's mental health. So this is an analysis that we presented in Boston a couple of months ago, and it's looking at the association between menopausal symptoms and reported psychological distress. And the way we capture psychological distress is with a series of four questions called the PHQ-4, Patient Health Questionnaire 4, which is a validated brief screening tool for depression and anxiety. Using this tool, in the overall prime cohort, we found quite high levels of psychological distress. Nearly 30% of women reported anxiety, quarter of them reported depression. When you combine those two together, 45% of women screened positive for psychological distress according to this um, validated tool. And we found that distress was associated with ethnicity, employment, education, 
whether women have their basic needs met, use of alcohol. I'm sure none of these are particularly groundbreaking findings to any of you in this room. Critically, we found no association with either CD4 count or HIV viral load. So it's really showing the huge impact of sociodemographic factors on um, psychological distress. But we were interested in seeing whether menopausal symptoms had an impact on this. And here what you can see is dividing it up between women who had somatic symptoms, so this is the hot flushes, the body aches, the sleep disturbance, and the women with the urogenital symptoms, which is the vaginal dryness, the pain during sex, the recurrent urinary tract symptoms. Um, firstly, looking at the somatic symptoms, the women who reported having somatic symptoms were nearly twice as likely as women without symptoms to report being psychologically distressed. And again, if you look at the urogenital symptoms, 58% of women with urogenital symptoms reported psycholog psychological distress compared to 19% of women who did not report urogenital symptoms. Again, I think that's an important finding. I would be really cautious, I'm going to sound like a typical epidemiologist now, about um, how you interpret these data. This is a cross-sectional study, so you don't know the direction of this relationship. I can't stand here and say these symptoms are causing distress. It could be you're distressed and experiencing more symptoms. We don't know the direction of this relationship, but I think this is an important finding. There is something in here about the association between menopausal symptoms and psychological distress. And again, this is highlighted by this participant quote here, where um, this participant is saying, well, my menopause is now interrupting my life quite seriously. I think I've gone into a depression. My sleeping pattern is so horrendous and so chaotic that I feel very emotional. So I'm now going to hand over to Naz, who's one of our master's students from last year, who's going to present her master's dissertation analysis, and then um, I'll rejoin later. So, um, menopause is known to be associated with impairments in sexual function during sex in one of the largest studies um, on sexual behaviour and lifestyles internationally. However, there remains um, scant data on the sexual function of women living with HIV as they get older, with most data, as Shima mentioned, coming from the US. So we wanted to answer the question, is HIV status associated with sexual function in women aged 45 to 60? And in order to answer this question, we needed a comparison group and therefore obtained data from NatSAL 3. So NatSAL is one of the largest studies of sexual behavior and lifestyles internationally. Um, and it studies both men and women aged 16 to 74 using a computer administered questionnaire as well as face to face interviews problems as listed here on the slide. Um, also, a sexual function score can be calculated using NatSAL SF, where a higher score indicates lower sexual function. And for this analysis, we included women aged 45 to 60 who were sexually active in the past year, which is defined as having had vaginal, anal, or oral intercourse, um, because NatSAL, as mentioned, NatSAL SF is only validated for those who are sexually active. So getting into the data, on average, um, women living with HIV were younger than those um, without HIV. And over 80% of women without HIV were white British in our sample, whereas almost 70% of women with HIV um, were black African. Um, compared to women without HIV, women living with HIV were more likely to be premenopausal. However, this is most likely um, due to um, women living with HIV in our sample being younger than um, women from NatSAL. Okay, so um, reporting at least one sexual problem lasting three months or more in the past year was statistically significantly more likely among women living with HIV, with 69% of women living with HIV reporting at least one sexual problem in the past year. Um, lasting three months or more in the past year, compared to only 54% of women without HIV. 
And listed here are the types of sexual problems that women living with HIV, well, women in general, are reporting. Um, and overall, women living with HIV were more likely, statistically more likely, to um, have low sexual function compared to women without HIV. And we also looked at the association of menopausal status on sexual function in both women living with and without HIV combined, but we didn't find an association. However, when we looked at the groups um, separately, um, we found that menopausal status was associated with sexual function among women from prime, so women um, living with HIV, but not in um, the NATSAL sample. So among women living with HIV, um, the most commonly reported sexual problems were lack of interest in sex and vaginal dryness. And this was similar to women um, without HIV, however, in greater proportions among women with HIV. And finally, women living with HIV were significantly more likely to seek help for sexual problems compared to women without HIV. Um, however, it is important to note that um, because um, the women from Prime were women who are attending HIV care and therefore more likely to be asked and have opportunities to ask about their sexual health and well-being um, and seek advice. So. Um, overall, so this is the largest study to date on sexual function in women living with HIV in the UK. Um, and in this analysis, um, we found evidence um, for an association um, of HIV positive status and low sexual function. And for this reason, we advise the integration of sexual function assessment into routine HIV care. Thank you. So I'm glad you had a bit of a break from me for five minutes. Well done, Naz. Um, I should add that Naz um, presented that work. In um, we looked at the use of a variety of treatments um, that are used during the menopause, the most common ones being HRT. It's now been rebranded as menopausal hormone therapy, MHT, um, which are advised by NICE to be offered to women who have vasomotor symptoms, so hot flushes, and also mood-related changes of menopause. And also we looked at the use of vaginal oestrogens. Um, so vaginal oestrogens available is either creams or tablets that can be uh, used to great effect to improve vaginal symptoms of menopause. And what we find in the PRIME study is a really low use of both these treatments. We found that 8% of women who currently had symptoms, somatic symptoms for which MH, uh, HRT may be indicated, were currently using HRT. And when we looked at women with urogenital symptoms, you'll remember that's about 70% of women reported urogenital symptoms, only 3% were using vaginal oestrogens. Um, I've been speaking to Cathy Abernethy, who's here today, and she's the president of the British Menopause Society, and she says, Actually, these findings are reflective of the broader use of HRT and vaginal oestrogens in the general population. It's underused amongst women. But I think what is striking is that this is a group of women who are engaged in healthcare. They're attending clinics. It's not that they're not seeing medical professionals. They're seeing healthcare professionals regularly and are still not getting access to this kind of treatment. Um, I'm not saying that everybody who goes through the menopause has to be on HRT, that's really not my message, but I think at least that opportunity to have a discussion about it, or at least know it exists, is important. In terms of the urogenital symptoms, I think, for me, that's one of the key take-home messages in my clinical practice now. 70% of women in this age group will have vaginal symptoms or urogenital symptoms. We know it's associated with poor quality of life. Vaginal oestrogen is cheap and it has virtually no side effects. We work in, many of us who are clinicians here, we work in sexual health services. We are in the right place to be talking about sexual function with women of this age group and offering this um, because it vastly improves women's quality of life. It maintains their relationships and I think it's a really important, quick, easy intervention. So the other thing that we wanted to do was really think about how is HIV and menopause currently managed. I already knew how HIV and menopause was managed within HIV practice as an HIV consultant. It's really something that hasn't been on our radar, although increasingly there are more HIV women's services being set up that are definitely attending to this. 
We wanted to look at how GPs were managing this because we often in HIV clinics say, oh no, that's a GP problem, go and see your GP, especially around things like menopause. So we did a survey of GPs at, a sexual and at two sexual and reproductive health conferences. So when I'm presenting these data, remember this is a self-selecting group of GPs who work in sexual and reproductive health who lead on menopause management in their practices. So this is the best case scenario, and it's important to keep this in mind. So we surveyed 200 GPs, and we asked them, how confident do you feel managing menopause symptoms in your patients? And we asked them about HIV-negative women and women living with HIV. And what you find is, unsurprisingly, because this is a group of GPs who lead management of menopause in their practices, that almost all of them felt confident managing menopause in women without HIV. However, when we asked them about women without HIV, less than 50% felt that they were confident managing menopause in this group. These are the GPs that we're sending our patients back to, to be managed. We also asked them, well, where do you think menopause should be routinely managed? And again, unsurprisingly for HIV negative women, the majority, almost all of them thought that menopause should be managed within primary care. It's a group of engaged GPs. A very different story for women living with HIV. But half of them thought, yes, menopause should be managed in general practice. A fifth of them thought it should be managed in a menopause service, of which there aren't that many, can be difficult to access. And I think, worryingly, a quarter of them thought it was HIV physicians' responsibility. And that's a real concern, because we don't think it's our responsibility, and we're batting patients back to their GPs. <laughs> So I think this is really important evidence really to show how women are getting caught between two types of practitioners. And again, this is a particular product. A lot so related to that, I think, and probably more importantly than the offering of treatment, is this lack of information that women report that they have. It was quite common in the focus groups for women to, and in the interviews for women to describe being underprepared for menopause. And that's partly because culturally we don't talk about menopause. We're talking about it more these days, but it's still not something that's commonly discussed. But I think also remember this is a group of women who predominantly are from migrant African communities where many of these women reported that within their cultural communities, this was a very taboo subject. You did not talk about it openly. Or if you did, you'd usually talk about it with your aunties, your elders back home, but you've migrated, so you don't have that anymore. So who do you go to to talk to about it? So 47%, nearly half of women in prime, that said that they did not have sufficient information about the menopause. And this participant really put out a plea to all of us, which is it would be good to hear about menopause earlier, then we would start noticing it in our bodies. It would be a thing that we know, not a kind of shock. You don't know what is happening to you. Come and teach us, tell us more. And I'd like to tell you a story about one of the participants um, again from one of our focus groups, who talked about having had menopausal symptoms for about three or four years. She had been long at hearing a group of other women complaining of the same things and realizing that that's what's happening. And I think that brings me to this really key finding, which I'm so keen to try and push forward on. And I know that Rebecca's touched upon this and Janine, Jane and Fiona have talked about this. And this is the power, the absolute critical power of peer support. Um, peer support has an amazing tradition in HIV, especially when it comes to supporting women living with HIV. However, historically, it's focused around pregnancy. We have fantastic mental mother programs with great evidence internationally. What we found doing the focus groups and in the interviews, certainly in the focus groups, were that women found tremendous support from being in a group together, being able to talk about their symptoms. And by it being a space, safe space, knowing that everybody else in the room was also living with HIV, so you could be open about your status and the particularities of living with HIV and going through this. And this woman said that, well, now that we're together in the focus group, we understand we are all going through the same thing. We really need to talk about this and learn from each other. One thing that I was really struck by when we were conducting the focus groups, and this is partly due to our 
peer, uh, our peer researchers being so good at f facilitating this research, but it was probably the most oversubscribed research I've ever done, <laughs> um, which you never expect with qualitative research. We did three focus groups. The last focus group, we were expecting six women. Twelve women turned up. Three of the women who turned up in that third session had already been to a previous focus group. A few months, so we're going to be busy. Um, one impact of Prime that I'm particularly pleased to see was that we were invited to contribute to the Beaver Bash FSRH guidelines. And that's the first time there's been a section in the guidelines for the menopause management of women living with HIV. And I think that's a really important step in recognizing the needs of women aging with HIV. So now we have a clear framework of how we should be providing care to this group of women and a minimum standards that we need to achieve. And it's not rocket science, we can all do this. It's asking a woman when her last period was and doing that at least every year. And then when a woman hits 45, to ask her proactively about menopausal symptoms. So we're not recommending anything fancy, it's the feminism going back into the community and just getting women together to talk about their bodies and their health. And that's been a really fantastic experience. And the final impact of Prime, for me personally, is a, I still work as a jobbing doctor, not much these days, but one day a week. Um, for me as a clinician, it's been really important to feed back the results as I was seeing them emerge and before they were published into my practice. And as a result of this study, I've set up a specialist HIV menopause virtual clinic at Mortimer Market Centre, where colleagues can refer, so all healthcare professionals, um, psychologists, nurses, other doctors can refer patients to me and I can review the notes with a GP that I work with who has a special interest in menopause. We review notes and then we phone the patient and write the GP or invite the patient to come back and see me for a face-to-face -face appointment where we can talk about her needs in terms of menopause care. And that's a model that I'm trying to present across the UK in the hope that it can be adopted as a cost-neutral model of care for women living with HIV. But we have loads of data and a wealth of data on nearly 900 women, um, probably about 60 hours of recorded interviews and focus groups. So this is an open invitation because the collective knowledge in this room is really incredible and to those of you on the live stream as well. Um, if you have any ideas, if there's a question that you have that you think we might be able to answer, just get in touch because now's the time for us to really bring these data together and try and answer any burning questions you have. So it really is an invitation for you to work with us and help take the findings even further. So just before we break for coffee, um, really the key findings, I think, for you to mull over um, before we return at four. In Prime, what we're doing is, what we've found is a high level of menopausal symptoms across a variety of domains, both psychological, somatic, and also urogenital. We've seen, an we've seen an association between menopausal symptoms and mental health. And we're also seeing an association between HIV status and sexual function in women of this age group. And I think NASA's analysis is really key because women aged between 45 and 60 are often overlooked when it comes to their sexual lives. We found that nearly half of women living with HIV did not have enough information about the menopause. We found that GPs lack confidence in managing HIV and menopause, and they report concerns that I think can be easily addressed. I think the study, to me, has time and time again um, underlined the critical importance of peer support across the life course, so moving beyond mental mothers and thinking about that great term that somebody came up in a focus group, mentor aunties. And I think the final thing for me that is really important is that women living with HIV will participate in research. When I started this study, lots of people told me, oh, it's going to be very difficult. You're going to find it very difficult recruiting women living with HIV for this study. That has, I think we have demonstrated that is categorically not the case. So from my point of view, I think we need to be asking the right questions and we can only ask the right questions if we work in partnership with women living with HIV to find out what questions are relevant to them. 
I think if you ask the right questions and you have the meaningful involvement of women living with HIV at all stages of the study, and I'm really delighted that it's not only have we had peer researchers and women on the advisory group, we've had Jane do, I think you'll agree, the phenomenal graphic design work on this report, um, who has worked with me closely to visualise the data so beautifully. But I think it really underlines how important it is to have women's involvement at all stages. I think if you get that right, women will participate. So I'm going to end there so we can break for coffee. And if you have any questions, I guess. <laughs> So, um, so I'll, I'm going to respond to both points. So the first one about being shuffled from pillar to post if you have a long-term condition, I think is absolutely right. And I think we see that with HIV as well. This isn't just menopause care. I think if you have HIV plus something else, GPs often find the managing something else more complicated. So I don't think this is unique to this um, particular area. Thinking about the design of the study, so. Uh, when we did the NAPSAL and PRIME analysis, we did take the same age range, which is 45 to 60 in both studies, but it just so happened that the median age in PRIME was uh, slightly lower than in NAPSAL. And I think that's why you see the slight difference in menopausal status, but also we use a very um, broad definition of postmenopausal status because we don't have such detailed menopausal status data in NAPSAL because NAPSAL wasn't designed to look at that. Um, you ask a really important question about early menopause. So um, both premature menopause and uh, so premature early menopause and premature ovarian insufficiency. So that's menopause under the age of 45 and menopause under the age of 40. And these are really, really important groups of women. These are women who are likely, because of the length of time they won't have oestrogen, are going to be at elevated risk of comorbidities and mortality, and we know that. And that is probably only going to be um, increased by the fact that you're living with HIV, so your risk of cardiovascular disease and osteoporosis are already elevated. We deliberately didn't look at women under the age of 45. And the reason being that early menopause and premature menopause are still very rare. We would have to have vastly increased the number of women that we approach. So in terms of feasibility, it would have been difficult. But also, we felt that this was an important question in its own right and needed a study in its own right, because the management of early and premature menopause is different. Women, certainly with premature ovarian insufficiency, should be on HRT, um, whereas women over the age of 45, this is something that is based on symptoms. So it, it, it's managed slightly differently. Um, but I do think it's an important area and something that we need to look at going forwards. There are some studies out there that suggest women living with HIV are more likely to have um, early menopause or premature ovarian insufficiency. Again, those studies are problematic because they tend to be from 10, 15, 20 years ago. So we need more up-to-date data on a group of women who are diagnosed and put on treatment in good time. Can I just pick up from Khalid's point? Um, really interested to hear that you've got a dial in menopause clinical facility, mm. uh, and I'm really interested to know how you've managed to fund that, um, because it's something, again, long-term conditions yeah. and HIV care being split, commissioning-wise, 
Um, and is this something yeah. that GPs are paid to do one thing, we're paid to do something else? Is this the beginning of a model? <laughs> so, or is this uh, um, you know, an innovative thing that you're trying out with your fingers crossed? It's it's sorry. I'm literally, <laughs> please like to say that. Um, if you can if you can work that out, yeah. right, it would be fabulous for so many other things. So I am conscious that my boss is in the room. <laughs> <laughs> so how are we doing it? We're kind of flying under the radar. Okay. I. I am fully funded as an academic, so my clinical time is given for free. So to some extent, I can choose what I do in that clinical time because my clinical sessions are being funded by um, the university. So that has allowed me to take one session a week to devote to this virtual menopause service. But the great thing is, is because we're not occupied, because again, room space is a real issue, and having patients come in is a real issue. All of these things cost, cost. So the fact that it's a virtual service, and me and Christina, who's the GP I work with, just meet once a week. We go through the electronic list. We discuss all the patients. Really important for our own professional development as well. And then we either phone the patient, or we write to the GP, or we write to the referring clinician. And that seems to have worked very well, and it provides a source of support for other healthcare professionals in um, the clinic. It's definitely, I've seen an upturn in the amount of referrals we've had over the past year and a bit. Um, increasingly, though, I'm having to bring patients back into my clinic because th when you're having discussions, certainly about HRT, some of those discussions are very complicated, especially if you need to address people's concerns about risks versus benefits. And those are the kind of questions you have to do face to face. Maybe showing a signpost to a whole of them with important questions. Other points, yeah. I was wondering to congratulate you on your um, demand when you went to from the Black African community. So I've worked on that, so that's a sign of gratitude. Oh, great, also, thank you. So you have had this before. I think it's definitely discussion that is going on at the moment, like all the cuts that are going on. I'm, great. I'm so glad that you. Um, but growing up with HIV is a big debate around now, so what would you reckon some of your recommendations for your study for other people who maybe doing research would actually say what, because you have such a big cohort of women, what would be recommendations how to do other types of research in growing up with HIV and other COVID disease? So I think it really comes down to what I was saying earlier, what's been really critical to, well firstly, what was important is that we were very well funded. This was a really well funded study by the NIHR, who um, gave us the resources to be able to conduct this. And we couldn't have done this, you know, this is not something that could have been done without that hefty injection of money and support. Plus, I was very well supported in terms of the academic institution I work with. So I have the infrastructure to be able to do this. But it really, the, the key thing is going back to what I've said um, quite a few times today, which is the meaningful involvement of women living with HIV or any patient group that you're going to be working with right from the start. Now, although our community reps weren't involved in the design of the study, other people, including some one person who sat in this room, <laughs> definitely reviewed this proposal at the very start. Yes, Angelina, that is you. <laughs> um, so I went to my group of trusted friends right at the start to run ideas past them and say, hey, I'm thinking about doing this. Does this make sense? have a sense check, they read the initial proposal, they fed back. So women living with HIV have been involved right from the inception and that is really, for me, that's an important ethical commitment in t terms of my research practice, but it also results in successful studies. So I guess that's my really key take home message. Time for one last question. Just to bring that to the so yes, we do. So we've developed a we've developed a questionnaire for women to complete before they're referred to the clinic, which really assesses symptoms, medical history, and a whole range of other things. I've got to say, it's virtually never completed. So usually, when I do my list, I don't I don't have that information to hand. Um, but the important thing is also the information that you give to women. So I've started giving out information sheets about menopause to women from the age of 35 upwards, which I think makes people feel horrified, but I think it's important, even if women don't read it for 10 years, to tuck it into their handbags and look at it another time. Um, you need to be proactive. So the AIDS map leaflet um, 
I tend to just print it out and give it to women and say, look, you know, just have it and just read it. It might be interesting or you might want to share it with somebody else. And I think that's, you know, preparing women for something that may happen in the next 10 to 15 years. Great. I'm going to stop this now. I think we have questions to keep this going all afternoon. But conscious of time, should we arrange some coffee somewhere? Where do you want us to go next? Um, so we're, all, we're staying in this room, here, but okay. grab tea and coffee. Yeah. All right. Uh, 15 minutes. Yes, please. Is that okay? Can we do a quick um, um, pop up? And thank you, everybody, so far.
fluid elements. So probably the key paper that's going to emerge over the next year is going to be the predictor, predictors of age at menopause and predictors of symptoms amongst women living with HIV. And that will be amongst the whole of the 870 women. We're currently, so we, are, we will be presenting some data at um, AIDS 2018 in Amsterdam on the association between menopausal symptoms and adherence to antiretroviral therapy. Pretty soon after that, we'll be working on a manuscript that will hopefully fuse both the quantitative and the qualitative data to really look at um, uh, another validated tool that looks at attitudes towards menopause. And then finally, I think for me, one of the key papers and the one I'm most looking forward to work on over the, uh, the coming months is really digging deep into the qualitative data and describing the experiences of women living with HIV going through the menopause, which will be the first time that's ever really been described. Um, and so that's probably the thing that I'll be working on next. So hopefully that gives you a flavour because I'm sure you'll read the report and have lots of questions about, well, you know, how does menopause affect this or that? Hopefully you can see where we're going to be taking um, the data over the coming months. And the next thing on our agenda is that we did manage to secure some funding for our first sub-study for PRIME. So we're very lucky to get funding from the British HIV Association in the form of a research award. Um, which is really important because it shows that people are willing to invest in this study longer term. Um, so we will be measuring follicle-stimulating hormone, FSH, which is a marker of menopause in the blood in postmenopausal women who participated in PRIME. So these are the women who said that they hadn't had a period for 12 months. We want to take their blood and confirm whether they were actually postmenopausal according to blood test results. And the reason why that's important is that if you look at the literature, women living with HIV are more likely to have other reasons for not having a period other than menopause. So something we call anovulation. And that might be due to other coexisting, um, be commencing in the summer, we'll be um, going back to 100 women. So one thing I didn't say about um, Prime is, um, which makes it such a useful resource, is um, we asked all the women who participated in Prime whether they'd consent to contact for future studies. And the vast majority, over 80% of women, have consented to be contacted again. So what we actually have is a database of women who are willing to participate in future research related to this work. So we're able to easily go back and invite women to participate. So that's going to be starting probably August time for about six months. And that brings me to, well, what happens next with the study? So as I've alluded to, um, our funding ended in May. So we're currently, the study is currently unfunded apart from this um, small sub-study. We call, I mean, I, I still have the time and space to be able to focus on the analysis, but we don't have the resources to be able to continue the study. And I think that's a real shame because we have the startings of something really important here, this cohort of women aging with HIV, who I think if we can follow them up longitudinally, we'll get some really important data about aging and HIV in women. So I think the things that we really need to focus on from my point of view is thinking about how we can secure the ongoing follow-up of the prime cohort. And that's really difficult because funders don't like cohort studies at the moment. They think that they're expensive. Um, so we need to have a think about how that could be framed. The other thing, as I've alluded, Harrison Group in 60 who are HIV negative. And you need to think about, well, where do you recruit a group of women who are ethnically diverse who are HIV negative? Previous studies, so I'm thinking about the Poppy study, which is a big study on HIV and ageing, has tried to recruit HIV negative women as a comparison group. And what they've ended up with is a group of women who are 80% white British. And it is very difficult then to do meaningful comparisons because, of course, ethnicity and culture and other socio-demographic factors are going to come to play. And you can do all sorts of clever statistical adjustments, but you're never going to be able to get a true meaningful comparison. So it isn't that we neglected it, it's just actually practically very difficult. But I think there's um, some real work to be done methodologically and going back to funders and thinking about ways of recruiting an ethnically diverse comparison group. So my approach would be to think about a methodological application, funding application, to think about experimenting and piloting ways of recruiting HIV negative women from diverse ethnic communities. I'm really glad to see Naz in the room here, who I'm sure we can have over a drink. 
Some other really exciting developments, um, led by Mona Lutfi um, in Toronto. I, if you're really interested in HIV and women, I would really urge you to read their work. Their work is amazing. Um, the Y study, which is the big US cohort study that's been ongoing for nearly 20 years. Um, and also there's a group in Frankfurt who are hoping to be, uh, uh, led by Annette Herbel, um, who are hoping to do work similar to Prime. All of these groups are really interested in pooling data, and that's really exciting because if you think about us pooling data either with CHIOS, which has data on about 1,000 women, and WISE, which have thousands of women in their cohort, we could get some really phenomenal research done and also look at the differences internationally as well. The next set of things that I've been thinking about and ideas that we've been working on. Um, so for the past 18 months, we've been working on funding applications pretty much solidly without much success. Um, so we've put in two applications to develop interventions for women living with HIV, both of them peer-based applications, peer-based or peer-led interventions, both of them turned down by funders. So it is a really hard funding climate at the moment. However, it is so clear to me when I think about the study and the data and hearing um, as well how important peer support is. So banging my head again and actually doing high quality research, looking at the importance of peer support and um, providing the evidence to be able to secure investment in peer support going forward across the life course, not just around the time of pregnancy. Women do a lot of other things apart from just being pregnant. Um, one thing that I had worked on um, with colleagues from City University who are here today is thinking about the development of a mobile app. So it's many women that we spoke to during the interviews and focus groups said they don't really want to engage with face-to-face -face peer support because they're busy or because they're worried about going to a face-to-face -face session that actually... I know this may seem a radical idea that people over the age of 40 do use smartphones and are technologically literate. I'm saying that as someone over 40. Um, so actually the development of technology that is there to support women who are older and aging with HIV I think is really important. That was one of the funding applications that got turned down sadly. Another thing that um, we've been thinking about is um, the use of cognitive behavioural therapy. So Myra Hunter who's a uh, academic at King's has done a lot of work, RCTs looking at CBT for women with menopausal symptoms, so this is something that we may want to revisit with women living with HIV. Again, this is an ethnically diverse population. A lot of the work on CBT and menopause has been conducted with predominantly white middle class women. So we have an opportunity actually to look at these interventions that are recommended by NICE, but actually see do they work and how do they need to be adapted for other groups. One really interesting project that, um, again, colleagues from City University have approached me about is the use of graphic medicine. I didn't know graphic medicine existed until a few months ago. So graphic medicine is the use of comics, comic books, to illustrate experience and um, uh, provide people with a space to share stories and a template for really how to improve their care and well-being. So um, I'm seeing a big enthusiastic nod from Jane. <laughs> so that's good. Um, so uh, my colleagues at City University have, always, have already used this approach um, in graphic medicine, uh, using graphic medicine with um, carers for people with dementia and have produced a fantastic comic. Um, so there is a real growth of interest in using this approach um, to support people's health and well-being. And we're going to start having conversations about putting in a funding application to the Wellcome Trust to really try and take that forward, given the wealth of qualitative data that we already have that we could translate into a comic. And then finally, thinking about the sort of more clinical medical side of things, we've, sh we've seen that the use of um, HRT is low in this population. Um, I think it would be really important to look at the use of HRT in women living with HIV specifically. We know that women living with HIV 
are at greater risk of having mood disorders. We know that mental health is a significant issue. We also know that women living with HIV have significant sleep issues, often as a result of their antiretroviral therapy. One thing that interests me is we often switch antiretroviral therapy because of sleep issues, but we don't actually know whether those sleep issues could have been addressed by using HRT. So I think there's a lot of work to be done specifically about the role of HRT in managing symptoms amongst women living with HIV. And then finally, thinking about the role of HRT as primary prophylaxis for comorbidities. Um, for many years, we've been very reluctant to use HRT because of all the scare stories. Um, recently, there's been more confidence in using HRT. I think nice guidelines that came out a few years ago really have helped reassure people, but also um, uh, recent repeat analysis of um, the Women's Health Initiative has given us more confidence in the safety of HRT. We know that HRT improves bone mass. We know that HRT is likely to improve cardiovascular, well, we know that it improves your cardiovascular health. We also know that women living with HIV are increased risk of osteoporosis and cardiovascular disease. I think there may well be scope to not just be using HRT as symptomatic treatment for this group of patients, but to be looking at the impact of using HRT as primary prophylaxis to prevent comorbidities. This is a group of women at increased risk of comorbidity who often have treatment switches, so we tinker around with their antiretroviral therapy. My feeling is, actually, if we addressed estrogen depletion, we might have more benefit. We just don't know. So that's something that um, we will be thinking about over the coming years in terms of thinking about can we do an actual RCT or another trial, another type of trial to really try and look at the role of primary prophylaxis in this particular high risk group of women. But I'm sure that's not everything. Those are my ideas and ideas I've had with colleagues and conversations I've had with people. This is again a plea. You all have brilliant ideas yourself. Is there anything else that we can do with this study? How can we take this forward? How can we persuade funders to give us the money to keep this going? Because I think it would be terribly sad if we're not able to keep this study going and really build on this momentum. I'm going to end there. Back of the report, all my details. Report, you can tweet, Shima is, is socially media connected. Oh, <laughs> uh, so tweeting, email, but keeping this momentum going. And actually, I think the panel discussion may indeed generate even more mm. thoughts. So maybe we should, at this point, ask our panel to come along. Uh, holding is one of the questions, perhaps, for you as well, to think about what those next steps might look like as well as what they've heard already, if that makes sense. That's great. Thank so, you. Shima, thank you for that. I've gone off thinking, oh, yes, good. <laughs> <laughs> uh, lots of excitement. So, can I now invite our panel uh, up to, we've got some chairs here. Um, so, if we could have Cathy. Cathy Abeniki is the chair of the British Menopause Society, uh, co lead of the NHS Menopause service in Harrow, um, and an advocate for better education in menopause for healthcare professionals and women, and you've got a book, Menopause and One Stop Guide. Yep. So this is Cathy. Uh, who's next? Yvonne. Um, find yourself at the seat. Yvonne Gillis, consultant physician in Brighton. Um, particular interest in the care of women living with HIV. You've set up a women's specialist clinic. Um, you've put a menopause section into that. Yes. Um, and so a very experienced clinician with all sorts of innovative women's care. Robin Bonner, you want to go next? I know where to start with Robin. Robin is a Renaissance woman in that she's done so many different things. At the moment, leads on a campaign called She Decides about women's reproductive rights in the post-Trump funding cut era um, and trying to ensure that governments backfill 
that space mm -hmm. uh, to make sure that women get the reproductive health care they need. A past chief executive of the International AIDS Society, a past work at the Terence Higgins Trust, wrote the first book on women and HIV, virgins, Perhaps virgins and victims. Which was 1980. No, no, it was 90s. 19. Was it the 90s? Yeah, okay. it was early 90s. Um, but nonetheless, <laughs> simply a measure of her experience in the field of women's health and HIV in particular. Um, Lorraine Cher, Professor of Psychology at the World Free Campus of UCL. Um, interested, you've been in family health for a long time, done a lot of work looking at the care of women with HIV, families, working with UNICEF, work outside the UK, and you've been part of the expert advisory panel for this study. Deborah Gold, Chief Executive of the National AIDS Trust, um, who uh, is leading a hugely successful series of campaigns at the moment, um, with a great deal of success. Um, but actually, NAT has a very nice report on HIV in the heterosexual population, uh, looking at long-term care in the NHS and a variety of really important policy implications. And Rebecca Mebwe, I'm going to get it right this time, um, who is a long-term advocate uh, and has done a huge amount of work, and you've heard some of her story already today, uh, but brings experiential uh, expertise as well as your role in working with a lot of women uh, over different periods of the life course in different peer support settings. Um, so that's our panel. Um, we've got, I think, what have we got, Shima? We've got about 25 minutes in total, half an hour perhaps. Yeah. Um, but I think all four of you have been, I'm going to use the word, I think, proud <laughs> to bring some thoughts on four key questions, which are what the take-out messages are for you, particularly in the roles that you're in, something about what the implications for clinical practice for those of you who are clinicians, and the implications for policy for those of you that come more from that background, and then feeding back into Sheila's question, from your perspective, the, the frame that you have on this world, what should we do next? So that's our sort of agenda for the next little while. Who wants to kick off on the key take-home messages? Where should we start? I'll start, Kathy, if why you like. Why don't you start giving us the, the sort of wider menopause view? Yeah, I mean, it's interesting because I don't work in HIV. I spend my whole working week doing menopause. That's what I do. I'm working in NHS clinics, <coughs> private clinics, go into workplaces and raise awareness of menopause and do some menopause research. But, you know, HIV is, has not been included, really, in my remit at all. So it's really interesting to read this report that Shima has sent me. And, you know, the surveys that we've done through our society bring up exactly the same points that this has, has raised. Women don't have enough information, they can't access the help they need, and GPs are not very good. But it's even worse for women with HIV. It seems to be the message from this report. So even fewer women access good medical treatment. GPs are even less educated on menopause than they are for women without HIV, and the symptoms are even worse. So, you know, from my point of view, we have to get the message out there to healthcare professionals, but also to women, um, because actually there's a huge upsurge at the moment from women in the interest in menopause. I don't know whether you've seen it, you know, in the general population, it is not taboo anymore. You know, it's on TV all the time, but not for women with HIV. So that's where I would go. So maybe that should take us to Deborah, because actually we're not about HIV either. <laughs> so um, what's your reflection? I mean, lens? first of all, I just want to take the opportunity to say how fantastic this piece of research is and this afternoon has been. It's been really inspiring to hear about a piece of work like this that has properly involved people living with HIV and where it's clear that there's been real thought about the policy implications as well as the clinical implications and bringing both of those together. Um, I'm not surprised it's under-prioritised because women's reproductive health in general is under-prioritised and under-discussed. Um, but it was really helpful to see it all laid out so clearly. I, I was interested in the criticism that Shima talked about about the lack of a kind of comparator group because that felt a little bit like a red herring to me because the truth is... Does it matter whether or not we can prove that it's worse for women with HIV? What we can prove is that 
women with HIV are experiencing very high levels of these symptoms and they're engaging with care and we have an opportunity to do something about it. And if we can't get it right for women with HIV who have good relationships often Mm. with clinicians in an area where talking about this should be easier, then we can't get it right for any women. Um, So it feels like this is a really good place to start. Um, And just a reflection also in terms of what we need to do to get it right. I thought it was really interesting how few men there are in the room today. Um, So welcome to those of you that are (laughs) here. But I think one of our challenges is saying in our sector, many of the clinicians, many of the policy makers are men. And we know this is important, but that message needs to be spread out further than the people in this room if we're going to see change. Um, I'm going to turn things on on, on their heads slightly and say that actually I found this data in some way could be very reassuring for women. And I think because although it identifies a high rate of symptomatology, we are living in an era where follow-up has been significantly reduced. The frequency of interval between your appointments with your... And actually, I think, to know if you are given the correct information that menopause is very symptomatic in the vast majority of women living with HIV, and if you are armed with that information, it can take away a huge amount of worry for those women who may be at home between their six-month appointments or on a virtual floor worrying about the symptoms that they have, thinking, well, I don't even know my CD4 count. Could it be that it's dropped and we don't know? So actually, I think this is, you know, just to have this knowledge at last is brilliant. It's reassuring that we can then give this information to women so that we can inform them what symptoms they may experience and what symptoms, um, you know, even that the doctor is seeing them who may or may not have a good knowledge of menopause can then know about and discuss, you know, with good evidence for the first time ever in the UK. So I, you know, I think this is reassuring that at last we have data. I think it's just really brilliant, mm-hmm. really do. I think that's time to ask Rebecca, reassuring, <laughs> thanks for um, <laughs> I think, I think, I agree with you, it's reassuring, mm-hmm. um, that's clearly what came out in a lot of the focus groups, I think you'll agree, is that, gosh, I'm not alone, mm. and, and gosh, what I'm feeling is not completely, you know, sort of unrealistic or mad, or every time I mention it to my doctor, um, he probably thinks I'm crazy. So it is really, really reassuring. And I think it's um, long and long um, that we need this kind of, of research and data. And it's a very good um, sort of platform to develop even more. And also the fact that it's going to be very encouraging to get women to be actually really involved, because I think we're really lacking in that area. So, you know, we can say, look, this is what women can do, and it's a good sort of example that we can roll with and hopefully get even more meaningful engagement. Yeah. Lorraine, can I bring you in? Because there's such a high proportion of psychological issues. I'd be interested in your take on what you've heard. Good. Everything I've prepared, I'm just completely dissing. Um, I feel I've come home. Um, and it's a really good feeling. So thank you, Shima. And I feel I've come home because we've been saying so much for so long, and now we're actually not just saying and pleading, we're actually standing up um, and, and counting. So as a psychologist, I, I, I think that you didn't give us answers, uh, you gave us questions, and I have a whole load of questions. So I know that if you look at the general literature, they talk about syndemics. Syndemics is one of those silly jargon words that medics really make up, or I don't know who makes them up, just to befuddle everyone. It just means what happens when you have lots of things happening. And I actually think, for me, the big core question that's going to come out of the data is, you've got all these things with people, what happens for people who have the whole lot? So I'm really interested in that. But I love your idea of turning it around. So I'm also interested in... I suppose resilience, because look who's sitting in this room. I mean, just look at these people. You know, look at them. I mean, look at, I, just look at it. And that's what, yeah, I know. Get off your phone. <laughs> so, oh my God. So, so, my view is what about resilience? So, I think this data is so robust enough that it can actually generate. Oh, well, I can't wait. <laughs> 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 women who don't feel all of these 
these things. For everything you're saying, oh, 40% and 80 but 20% didn't. Even 3% didn't. Mm. Who are they? And how do they do that? And that's what I want to bottle. And we're sitting in this room, in this austere building, founded by Jeremy Bentham. And in fact, there's a stuffed e effigy of him in the foyer. <laughs> and that, to me, is the take-home word. Stuffed, really. <laughs> <laughs> and I shall not elaborate, but you all know what I think about the funding, about the issue, and about how we have to take it forward. Wow. Okay. <laughs> so, stop. Robin, where, where are you coming from? Well, I've got about 20 things sort of scribbled on, on my page, and, and at the beginning I was sitting there going, oh, crikey, I'm, I'm in a very looking back place because I've been looking at writing a new book and so I've been rereading what I wrote in the early 90s um, and there was nothing on menopause in my book from the 90s obviously because at that time women were not surviving there was really no expectation there would be many women with HIV to menopause and because we were not talking about the complexity of women's lives so also I was thinking when you started to say about being reassuring it's really reassuring, because the other thing I've been thinking as I look at my book is, oh, we've not really learned from history, and you have. Mm -hmm. I mean, the methodology is just wonderful, um, and, and it's just so beautiful to see. I think the first study I'm aware of in the UK that was really run by women living with HIV was in 92 by Positively Women, and they did a survey called Women Like Us. But the fact that now you've got clinicians and women with HIV truly meaningfully working together, I find that just hugely exciting, and a, and a model not just for the HIV world, but much more broadly and in, in, in the work that I'm doing now, which is more about talking across communities that have found themselves in silos and didn't used to be 30 years ago. One of the things that I also thought is just how brilliant your work was and how exciting it was to get back to the question of sexual pleasure, which again is something we keep dodging, right? And talking about sexual pleasure and menopause in itself, I don't know, maybe you talk about that all day, but <laughs> I'm not hearing much about that. Um, and um, so, so I, I thought that was exciting. I had some questions about this whole stuff around the low uptake of what I've now learned to call MHT. Um, and it made me think about how in the early days of the AIDS crisis in the UK, a lot of women with HIV did not take up ART really early on and actually that was a survival strategy for many who didn't end up on monotherapy so but what's that about you know what is the resistance so I've got lots of questions and I hope you will get tons of money to look at that question um, <laughs> could I say something about that yeah. um, first of all only the Americans call it MHT <laughs> in Europe it's friends. HRT okay. um, but um, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we're, we're resisting it all the way um, but you're right, I mean, women in general don't want to take HRT. I mean, I work in menopause clinics all week, and the very first thing any woman says to you is, please do something about my symptoms, but don't give me HRT. You know, the fear surrounding HRT across all groups is, is poor. So that's not just um, women with HIV. But we need, to, we need to get women across the board educated about that. But also, it comes back to the GPs, which in your study showed that you know, they, they were not keen to treat women with HIV because they were worried about the implications on that without thinking about the consequences, you know, the long-term consequences or the symptomatology consequences. So we need to educate those as well about so HIV. Can we just carry that discussion Because I'm a yeah. doctor. I was going to say, I mean, one of the things that we as doctors do, uh, we start somebody, we give them, you know, their tablets, their antiretroviral tablets, and we say, do not under any circumstances take anything else without checking. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, uh, oh, okay, uh, paracetamol? Okay. Uh, so, you know, the sense we, 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 are we confounding, you know, making it worse, the, the, the thing that, that Catherine's talking about? I mean, I'd agree. I think historically we have done. I mean, I think in our clinic, in the Sunflower Clinic, when I see a woman who is perimenopausal or postmenopausal, we try, we're planning for the long term, and so if she has side effects from her medication that she doesn't like and she wants to switch anyway, I do a cardiovascular risk score, I do a FRAX score, I usually do a DEXA anyway, uh, even if the FRAX doesn't tell me to, I ignore it. And uh, I'm deciding what does she need for the long term as a woman, as a woman with symptoms, and as a postmenopausal woman who will be at risk of, even if she doesn't have now, comorbidities such as low bone mineral density and cardiovascular risk and that to me is how we should all be thinking um, but
But, you know, and that's why I want all women to come into our clinic at some point, because I feel as well with the reduced follow-up, even though people are really well and that's great, I think what it does mean is that appointment that you have once a year is really pressurised, and I don't think women are catered for adequately. And, you know, the women spend an hour and a half, two hours in our clinic seeing me, but also a women's health advisor, um, a contraception and, and menopause specialist, um, and a nurse as well. So we try and do all of those things at once. So at some point, someone has sat down and thought about what are the needs of this woman now at this age? What might she need in a few years' time? So I am very, very keen to change ART to facilitate contraception or HRT. Mm -hmm. To me, it's not an issue anymore because we've got so many more medications and often they're much better tolerated than the old ones anyway. So I'm very keen that as long as you know, we have a good effective treatment for, for HIV, use something that will work for that woman for all of the other things she needs in her life, not just HIV. I think it's really important. And maybe go back to, to Rebecca, I mean, does this resonate? And just thinking about your relationship with your GP or whether you've got any experience of you know, what we're talking about here, either not getting what you need in the clinic or having a GP who doesn't quite get it at all. Um, or you were just able to go and say, excuse me, what well, how I wish we could. Um, and I, you know, I think a lot of us do experience this ping ponging business mm -hmm. anyway. You go to your GP and it tells you, oh, go back. Um, but I also uh, very much recognise what you're saying about the length of time between appointments. Mm -hmm. And, you know, you're sitting at home and wondering, oh, I wonder whether, and, you know, because you're well, mm -hmm. generally, you, you don't sort of think about those kinds of things that you, you've talked about and it would be a really good um, conversation to have mm -hmm. that yes can we take a look at all of these things well in advance of mm -hmm. especially where we're at now um, still trying to figure things out and the more we can sort of think about, think about things preemptively yeah. Um, yeah, the better, the better for the clinicians, because I, as well, you know, even in the long term, then you, you've sort of already made a platform for you to then pick up, whether it's 5, 10, 15, 20 years later, mm -hmm. um, oh, actually, we did think about that, it's much easier rather than starting from that point, mm -hmm. trying to gather data or, you know, go back and look on experiences in history, so yeah, that would be a really good way of approaching it, so... Mm -hmm. I think yes. these are all lessons that we need to be uh, trying to pick through. Deborah, what does this mean? I mean, again, just take it to the next step. Because one of the questions that, that keeps coming back is when we've got a system and a policy that is not facilitating mm -hmm. this joined up, even joining up mental health and physical health, even joining up HIV antiretrovirals and general practice. What can we think about to change policy, or do we have to do workarounds all the time? Uh, it's funny. I've so many things. I've scribbled so many things down. <laughs> um, I mean, I think this is this is symptomatic of a of a bigger problem, but it's a perfect example of the struggle we're having in the system at the moment to understand HIV as a long term condition and make the different bits of the system work together in order to facilitate care for the whole person um, and you know the, the kind of thing that you're talking about is such a great example mm -hmm. that is I think relatively rare to hear about so it's trying to work out how some of those examples can be spread further and how we can use some of the kind of new systems in the NHS to try to make the case for some of this god I'm just trying to look at this and make it make sense in terms of coming back to you with some kind of Really good example. I just think there's some really good examples around time, trying to coordinate between GPs and HIV clinics mm -hmm. that could be kind of spread. Um, I think there'd be a really interesting bit of kind of policy research that could be done around looking at some of the kind of examples and cases that came to this and taking them to things like the STPs and seeing whether there's a way of using that as an example for, yeah. So I think there's lots. Uh, the thing is, I've just come this morning from a meeting uh, of the London Clinical Senate mm. talking about systems. And the exactly. term that kept coming up was positive deviancy. Uh, <laughs> oh, and God. So it seems to me that we've had the most fabulous examples of positive deviancy. We 
which is people doing the right thing without it being commissioned. Yes. Uh, without permission. Um, without necessarily the funding. Um, you know, what you're doing is positive deviancy. That's, <laughs> and that's so exciting. And that's so exciting when it happens and it works. But the problem with that is that we have experiences of this all the time. It relies on the right person in the right place making something happen. And when that person leaves or when that system changes, that thing just falls apart. And it's, it's taking that and finding out a way to put it into the system. And I think that the evidence is so strong in this research that it can be used to try to present the case for that, both for this but more widely in terms of kind of some of the fragmentation with HIV because it's a great case study of where the problems are and where the solutions are. And maybe that takes... Robin, I mean, you've got a huge experience of problematic approaches to women's health. Mm -hmm. You know, you've been at the WHO thinking about this at a big level. I mean, and I think Deborah's point is really important that... How do you get sustainability into a program like this? You know, we spend this afternoon, we get our energised, and all we do something in front, start at something. How do we get that built in? Cranky, if I was really good at that, it'd still be there, wouldn't I? <laughs> um, it's clearly unsustainable. Um, I don't know, but I do. What I, one of the things I do know is that, you know, I'm co-leading this little team which is about She Decides, which is a, was sparked by Trump doing the wrong thing on abortion. And we then opened up the agenda to be about She Decides about everything to do with her body and her life and her future, but based on the body. And we talk about abortion and contraception and we talk about violence and we don't talk about menopause. And I'm sitting there with this really deep sense of shame. It's like, crikey, we've got so focused on this conversation which is going big and it's involving ministers and leaders from all over the world now talking much more constructively about pleasure and everything and not about menopause so I'm thinking yeah. hang on a minute there's something very small but hopefully impactful I can do about bringing that forward and, and I was also thinking about this HRT point I'm going to come out as a woman <laughs> using HRT patches but it's really stigmatised can we learn something from stigma as well and everything that I think the HIV world knows about stigma and in the world that I'm sort of now in, which is more about, you know, the broader conversation on sexual health and reproductive justice, that's something that's really important, that the HIV world has to teach. And I think that intersection on menopause and, and HIV, critically important for those of you living with HIV and menopause, but also hugely important yeah. to just take the learnings uh, more broadly. So I do think, you know, things like PMNCH, which is what I used to be running, Partnership for Maternal, Newborn and Child Health, that is supposed to have a remit across all of the life course. Um, for women, and it's really, in my experience, not tackling these kinds of issues and drawing these connections. So uh, I'll also take it forward in the, my dialogue with them. Mm, that's really interesting. And I was just going to say, you know, thinking about Lorraine and, and Catherine, this sort of issue of stigma, because there's some real similarities about what's going on in these conversations at a sort of psychological, emotional level. Uh, are there some sort of co-issues co here that we could be doing more together, if you like? Well, I mean, absolutely. I mean, I agree absolutely with Robin. And, be, and adding into the part that mental health is stigmatised mm -hmm. as well. Um, and it's a kind of a weird one where you, you have to say, well, hold on, the, the vision of mental instability or psychiatric disease, that's not what's going on here. This is a normal emotional reaction to a huge stressor. There's nothing... Um, pathological about that. That, in fact, that's kind of a very normal reaction. So, how can we deconstruct this big thing? Oh, it's a mental health. Oh, they've got anxiety. Well, of course they've got anxiety. I mean, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, so, so we have to plant the, the stigma. Um, so it's wound into very many of the pillars on which much of this uh, is. Mm. No, I mean, I agree. And also uh, what Shima pointed out when in her presentation is that just because women are presenting with anxiety or low mood at the time of the menopause doesn't mean it's the menopause causing it. You know, there are lots of other life issues going on at the same time uh, which can be contributing to it. And, and many women go through the, the whole menopause, menopause transition without any problems at all. But we don't really hear from them. Um, we tend to hear all of all the complaints and the negatives. And it's painted as a very negative time and actually it's not always. One thing we haven't touched on, we've talked a lot about women living with HIV, uh, 
who are already diagnosed, but actually I think one of the experiences probably for all of us in the HIV sector is the menopausal woman who goes to her GP with symptoms that were as a young man would be diagnosed as HIV and she's told she's menopausal and right. don't worry about it dear and you're a bit flustered and you've lost a bit of weight and you're a bit feverish, don't worry about it dear. Um, and actually, I think that scares me. <laughs> <laughs> we are seeing the menopause um, being used as a reason for being off. Example, what you were saying about depression, you're menopausal, and I'm not surprised you're depressed. You know, um, you've got uh, you're, you're not sleeping well. Um, you've got fevers. You're menopausal. Whereas actually, there are other diagnoses. How do we? How do we get the HIV conversation into? That's into your the, yeah. I think that comes back to your GP survey. Um, which was actually a, a really interested cohort already because they were the faculty members. Mm -hmm. So as you suggested yourself, if you'd gone out to normal GPs, it would have been far, far worse. Mm -hmm. um, and as a professional society, part of our remit is to educate healthcare professionals. Mm -hmm. So that's partly our job, really, to try and educate the healthcare professionals to just not see everybody with a flush as being the menopause. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And how we can support... Uh, th your work to make yes. sure HIV is appropriately put in. Yeah. Yeah. That's scaring you because we didn't yeah. need to do that. <laughs> <laughs> so, I think in general, I think we need to have more HIV testing across the board and not say yeah. risk groups if you test for HIV. And I think bring it at a younger age, young, younger women get tested more regularly. Mm -hmm. we, we have this conversation all the time, but I think we start saying, like, let's go to the menopause women have HIV tests. We need to have HIV tests for everyone mm -hmm. all the time. Yeah. It's something we don't talk about in menopause at all. Yeah. I mean, you know, my specialty is menopause. We never talk about HIV and testing, really apart from high risk. And I'm, I'm not, I didn't really yeah. for that. It's just the same indicated conditions that, you, that are being missed. Yeah. Yeah. Bring, it, bring it in the yeah. this conversation, maybe bring it more into family planning yeah. conversation about yeah. women as well. It's almost about 35. Well, you do something for 35, you're going to leave it over. Bring it in more into family planning in general. Yeah. Right. yeah. But exactly. So I guess other other points. Yes. Yeah, just to make a comment. In fact, everybody said about the GPs. Just I'm not a GP. <laughs> <laughs> be fair. I think we need to look at ourselves in the GPs. I think they see one patient with menopause, the next one with HIV, the next one with a brain cancer. I think asking the GP to do everything all the time is an un, I mean un, unfair. I mean it's unreasonable. So I think we need to be look at the whole system rather than just bashing on the GPs for it. And um, I'm sorry there are only three men here. <laughs> but honestly, I have expected a bit more of the BIs who were involved with the study and hardly anybody here. It, it looks like all other, other things to do. Coming back to the funding, I, I know, I mean, it, it's a hard thing. You write all the time, you never get that positive and then, then you forget about it. Is it any possibility of sort of combining with the other cohort studies in UK? I mean, you know, it's uh, either to go with the UK team, because we have got sort of such a number there. Are there any other way of sort of co-funding the things otherwise? So that's a very good point. What have we got already in place mm. that we can actually mm. bolt some things on onto it? Um, she might don't know if we want to respond to that. From yeah. yeah, so thank you for that. Um, we were quite forward thinking when we set up Prime, so we set up thinking ahead about collaborating with UK Sheep but also with Public Health England. So we collect data that will allow us to link both the PHE data sets and also potentially with Sheep. We have explored that because it's, it's quite complicated to do that kind of joint analysis, but that's definitely so. Caroline Sabin is one of the um, co investigators on this study, and that's definitely a conversation that Caroline, Caroline and I will be having about what kind of joined up work you can do. Um, the other obvious uh, collaborating cohort in the UK is the Poppy study. So I already have led on quite a few of the gender based analyses in Poppy, and we've had a lot of discussions about what Poppy and Prime can do. Certainly, one thing that will probably happen is because Poppy didn't recruit huge numbers of women, that they'd be able to boost their sample with prime participants, and that's something that we're exploring. So I think that's a really smart idea and something that we definitely need to pursue. If you're familiar with Poppy, which is people living with HIV, and people HIV free over and under the age of 50, so there's actually some really important overlap and potential data there. Um, are there any other points?
it's in the wrong people want to bring. Can I ask about the men men yes. We're talking about the, the breakout. How can we, you know, I was a gay man talking about, I can't really talk about this, but men, men involved in, in the women in the session of relationships. How can we involve men in this conversation around menopause in general? That's a bigger conversation, but simply using this study as an example. Could you talk about, talk about peer support, sexuality, sex life, those kind of things, and about you know, all these other things? How can we involve men in this conversation? Well, there, there is a lot of peer support now for women going through menopause, especially on social media. I mean, there's a, in the last two years, there's been a rapid increase in social media support. So there's things like the Latte Lounge, uh, there's Menopause and Me, oh, there's, there's loads of them. And some of those have got men's arms, so they've got like the man shed, it's called, things like that. <laughs> <laughs> so, so there is, but, but this is all um, self-driven by women, so it's being led by the women. Um, and it, there's a huge interest in it. I mean, maybe the um, support groups that you've got, the peer groups that you've got, could maybe link in with them in some way. I was just thinking exactly that. You raised the question, we've got NARS, we've got you know, all the relationships there, yeah. we've got data here, you're working on fact sheets, you've got all the menopause things, is there a three-way piece and a yeah. leaflet? Yeah. And I think there's something... Piece of education that would actually hit that... Yeah. There's something about the clinical representative groups taking a lead as well, so Beaver and Bash, mm -hmm. and I'd like to see them prioritising this kind of work at conferences and things right. where you have those audiences yeah. already there yeah. to yeah. force them to engage with yeah. this, yeah. basically. Yeah. Yeah. But I think the question here, I, I yeah, completely agree with you, is that if there is a role that men could play yeah. in, Support, in supporting, supporting facilitating, women. or in some way adding value, mm -hmm. are we missing a trick? Yeah, because I think the conversation around, and you're right, the conversation about women growing up history is NSM, mm -hmm. and there was a famous study that had less women that part of the study, but there was a recent the Sophie that talked about that as well. I think more women need to be part of the conversation, but the women that we're talking about generally essentially are heterosexual women and they have sex with men and they can be part of the conversation how they can empower women and support that woman and woman of the relationship or be aware of menopause and HIV in that conversation. That's what I was going to talk about. Can I also add yeah, that once you're thinking about extra work for Shima to do who's going to do it? Bring it on. It is bring it on. Um, a, a little bit biased, but um, you stop at 60 um, is life beyond 62, you know? <laughs> um, and so that might be really an interesting thing because one of the realities of people surviving is they'll survive from teenagers into, but they'll go on beyond 60. And I wonder, um, I suppose, some of the menopausal things might be done and dusted at some point, but then what next? So yes, what's on the horizon for the old old as opposed to the young old? That's a really important point. So um, I definitely it was really just pragmatic thinking about wanting to recruit women who were going to have menopausal symptoms and knowing that the majority of them would be in their 50s. Actually, extending it up to 60 meant that we had lots of women who weren't eligible because the women who were in their late 50s hadn't had a period for over five for years. years. So, um, I, I, I do think there's a whole load of work to be done about HIV and ageing in women. Um, the two major studies on HIV and ageing internationally predominantly focus on the experience of men and gay men. Um, their experiences, both biologically and socially, are going to be hugely different, um, which is why we have this group of women who are aged between 45 and 60, and if we can follow them up longitudinally, we'll be able to document the experiences of women ageing. Um, I did want to just come back to this question about men's involvement, um, just to highlight that actually in focus groups and interviews, when men were present, when men partners were present and supportive, it made a huge difference. So in, I do think there's something in being able to facilitate a conversation between partners about things that can be difficult. I do think men have a tremendously important role and that's overlooked. And certainly in the focus groups and the interviews, many women said, well, that's great if you have focus groups for us, but can you allow us to bring our partners in as well so they can hear what's happening to us? So I think a lot of work about including men as partners in this.
I think that is really important because a lot of the time you take this information home and because they've got absolutely no clue what it is you've come with, it's difficult for them to engage. I think more often than not, the only time they will try and listen is well, we'll say, well, there's no more sex after that. <laughs> <laughs> but that's the wrong approach. <laughs> you know, it's... it's yeah, but, but it is, I, I agree, it's really, really important. Because then you can get the support. It's not, it doesn't just happen within the peer support group. You can actually go home and he understands why you're grumpy and, you know, and all of that. Mm. And rather than be grumpy in return, you've got another form of support in that respect. I think that's quite important as well. Now look, we've got five minutes left, so I'm going to ask each panel member for one sentence on what next top priority to go out of this room to think they're going to do next. Let's start at this end this time. Lorraine. Everything. <laughs> Everything. Okay. Can you pack that just into one other sentence? <laughs> well, let's just get very strategic and I think evidence base is talking loud, um, putting women on the map. Um, I would if I was to prioritise, I'd say wonderful about the men, let's keep the woman stuff going. Um, and um, it's just intriguing that the funding has all come pouring in. Interesting. Mm -hmm. But I think that that's a job that shouldn't be given up upon. Very good. Robin. So what I'm thinking about is, you know, the, the, the movement I'm supporting is called She Decides. She decides about her body. She can only decide about her body if she knows about her body. So for me, my big take home is about knowing about all of the wonderful, sometimes annoying complexities of how our bodies work throughout our lives and embracing all women at all stages of their lives with and without HIV and other conditions mm -hmm. and making sure we get the right information and the right advocacy around that. Um, so I th I'm really intrigued by your next steps and thinking of um, hormone replacement therapy as primary prophylaxis. That's some not something I'd ever thought about before. Mm -hmm. And I actually think that is a really interesting thing to think about. And for me, it raises the questions about, um, particularly with topical estrogens, the acceptability of the use of topical estrogens in women living with HIV, because we know for the PrEP studies where tenofovir gel was used, it wasn't being used by women. And I think actually assessing how acceptable that is for women living with HIV and women without HIV as well, because I, I don't think it's it's some I, I don't think women talk about topical estrogens. They talk about the patch or they talk you mean about vaginal? Yeah, yeah, they don't they don't talk about it because I think it's just a very taboo subject. So I would be and really we don't ask clinicians are terrible. No, absolutely, and I think that would be really interesting. But it's also as well thinking of bone mineral density and and cardiovascular risk, I think FRAX and Q risk completely underestimate women's cardiovascular risk when they live with HIV. I think, you know, showing, a study showing or managing, looking at those women long term and looking at uh, HRT as primary prophylaxis and assessing that would be really, really important because I think that is just, that there is no data on that and I think that's what we need. So I really love that idea of, of HRT as primary prophylaxis. Great sentence construction, many phrases. <laughs> <laughs> is that, is, that, is that, that talking too much? <laughs> no, but uh, you absolutely summed it up, so thank you for that. Catherine, what's, what's So, your... um, with my British Menopause Society hat on, I can foresee that we need to be working much more together as professionals. So, you know, we're working in our little menopause alley, and, and you're working in your HIV field, and we're not getting together. And I think there needs to be a lot more guidelines um, and coming together. I mean, a, a simple example is that we do GP training on menopause and HRT. We do loads of things about managing menopause with long-term conditions. We need a case study for, of a lady with HIV, which we don't have at the moment. <laughs> we can, can we be done? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. This is the hardest thing you've ever made me do. <laughs> <laughs> that is impossible to believe. Exactly. Um, I'm going to go back and look at every single project that we're thinking about doing at NAT and think about how this might be relevant to that. Um, and as part of that, I'm doing phrases. <laughs> I particularly want to think about the Positive Voices project that we're working on with PHE. Um, and the interviews that we're doing with women coming up and making sure that we thought about this as part of that. And I'm going to make a date in my diary to start nagging Beaver about audit of the new recommendations in a couple of years to make sure that they're actually being implemented. <laughs>
last word. Um, I'm going to pick up on what Robin said in terms of information. I think, however, that rather than keep it within the HIV sector per se, I think actually put it out to anyone and everyone that will listen. Um, and then I'll just quickly also pick up on the point about the, the GPs. And, and I appreciate that they're under a lot of pressure. And yes, we shouldn't expect them to always take the initiative. However, as a woman living with HIV, if I've come to you, especially in the light of the fact that a lot of our stuff now is being referred to GPs, I would expect my GP to say, OK, fine, you're feeling the symptoms. At least let me try and think, oh, what do you think? Let's have the conversation, but I find a lot of the GPs, and don't get me wrong, there are some good ones, um, will just say, it's HIV, go back. And that's the conversation that we, you know, I need my GP to be able to have with me. Um, so yeah, that information needs to go out to everyone, just so we can work together. Good, we've got more than enough. Sure. What do you think? One thing. I'm sure you're not a GP. What I was going to do at the end, I'll do it now. I was going to paraphrase Jeremy Bentham, who's in the box outside. Yes. Um, because Jeremy Bentham is. He's, 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 he's actually downstairs in the vault. That's is he downstairs? A, that's actually he's, that's actually a, a sort of a mystery. A facsimile. That's just like his um, like a, a waxwork. His actual body is set downstairs in storage. That's stopped. Yeah, well, we it's stopped. Yeah. Nonetheless, we are on Jeremy Bentham territory. And it is he who said that we should reach for the stars whilst at the same time looking at the flowers beneath our feet. And for the first time in this, this bit of uh, the world um, that I've worked in, we have some flowers beneath our feet because Shima has grown them in partnership with all the people who've worked on this study. We have stars to reach for, we've heard about many of them. So um, look at the stars, nurture the flowers, beneath our feet. Um, that would be my sentence. Um, <laughs> and, um, <laughs> just like this, conclude so by thanking our panel very, very much, because it's actually, it's great to not only hear the data and the methodology, but just to get that immediate feedback from people who are interested, engaged, about what do we do next. And it's been a really exciting and productive afternoon. Shima, thank you for the most amazing study. <laughs>
very, very grateful and very touched to be here in this fabulous company. Yeah. <laughs> 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 okay. Oh. Give me a bath, maybe.